So let's continue talking about data center fabrics for a little bit. And right now I'm going to talk about some of the characteristics of data center fabrics and what makes a fabric kind of unique from the concept of a simple network. So let's look first at this um, and talk about the, the concepts of non-contending versus non-blocking. A lot of people get these terms confused or they use one when they mean the other. And in reality, they are completely different things. So let's look at this slide real fast and take a look. In a true non-blocking network, what I have is I have my devices, and I show them here as Dev1, Device2, Device3, Device4, so Dev1 through Dev4 are set up with logical send sides and logical receive sides. So they aren't necessarily broken into two devices. For instance, when the first concept of a non-blocking network came up, it was in the telephone network. And in a telephone network, of course, you have a little handset thing, and then you have your telephone device with sometimes you would have that little round um, dialer dialing on the front um, way way back or you would just have a handle on the side and you would dial one two three whatever these are single devices and they don't really truly have a send or receive side so it's important to differentiate the concept of the logical send and receive from the physical device having a physical send and receive circuit. In fact, in a telephone network, the only thing that has a send and receive side is really the, the making and breaking of the circuit. So you don't actually have a send and receive once the circuit is, is made. You simply make the circuit in a single direction. So in a non-blocking, a true non-blocking network, you have a send and receive for each one of these devices. And if you have Dev1, and of course this is a clo fabric here in the center that I'm showing this with, and in a true clo fabric, these would be crossbar switches. So you can remember all of that from the last time we chatted about data center fabrics. So in this kind of a network, if device 1 wants to talk to device 4, it's going to try to make a circuit, and say it comes up here, goes across and says, oh, I'll take this path right here. So this is the path that chooses through this network or through this fabric in order to reach device four. Now there's something interesting you'll notice that once this circuit is made, device four does not have any secondary receive circuit on which to receive traffic or packets or anything else. And device one does not have a secondary send circuit either. So therefore, you cannot talk to more than one device at a time. And this would generally be true of non-blocking fabrics. The reason it's non-blocking is that if device two wants to talk to say device three, there is definitely an alternate path to reach between those two devices. Um, and any pair of devices can speak to any other pair of devices, so long as two input devices don't try to talk to the same output device at the same time. You can't do that. That's why this is non-blocking. So in a true non-blocking network, what you tend to have is you tend to have something called admission control. Now, admission control is going to control who can talk to who and who, who cannot. This is where you get your make and break circuit from. You make the circuit, and admission control allows you to make that circuit, and once the circuit is made, the circuit can be broken later. So, in a non-blocking network, the key factor to remember is that the network itself, the fabric itself, does not drop any traffic ever. This is only possible if you have strong, efficient emission control with some type of a scheduler or something like that. Um, we'll talk about non-contending in just a moment um, as we go through and look at this in a packet switch network. So let's talk about scaling. The way you scale a network in a spine and leaf is you scale the network by scaling out. So if you have this many devices in the network, and this means that you have this number of ports plus this number of ports, remembering that I always put my spine in the center rather than on an edge, um, you'll notice that if you want to increase the number of edge ports, what you do is you increase the number of devices. And every device that you add out here, you have to add another device. This is called scale out. And it's called scale out because every, the size of each of these devices remains constant. As you add devices, you're adding more devices of the same size or scale. You're not actually adding a different size of 
device or you're not increasing the size of a device. In a scale up topology, what you have is you have your leaf nodes out here or your um, edge nodes. And then as you add more edge nodes into this network, rather than adding more of devices here in your, in your distribution layer, then what you do is you increase the size of these devices. You make them ever larger. So they start out small, they get bigger, they get bigger. You do this by adding line cards, by adding ports that aren't being used, etc. things like that. So that is the concept. This is, again, how you scale out. So you start with three columns and you move to four columns in that way. Two of the other interesting things about fabrics are, is first they are non-planar. So let me explain what a non-planar fabric actually means. Non-planar means that you see these cross points. You see where these links cross. Now, in an old electronics diagram, what I would do if I were going to show two traces on a board or two wires crossing one another is I would show the first wire running along. I would show the second line wire showing going across. But rather than showing them go straight across like this, which would imply there's a connection right here, what I do is, is I show it with a little hop in it. And that says these wires don't cross. This is actually how you do it. Now, if you think about it, if you turn that on its side, the first wire runs this way, the second wire is running along, and it hops over. If these two wires are on the same plane, then this hop over represents a second plane. So it's like multi-planar. So this is where you get the concept as well of multi-planar circuit boards, where you can have a trace on this plane that does not cross with circuits or the trace on this circuit. And then to make the two connect, you drill a hole through and you solder in both ends of it and fill in with solder or a wire or whatever. And that allows you to connect those two planes. So this is called a non-planar topology because you cannot not cross these at these points. The way the clo is or all spine and leaves are wired, you must have these cross points and they must go outside of the plane. They don't cross. Therefore, it is a non-planar topology. Another thing is that it's interesting about spine and leaf topologies is they are modular and replicating. So if I look at these three devices, well, these three aren't really good ones, but let's look at these three. You'll notice the set of connections that these have at every one of these, in every one of these um, stages or areas. If you look at these three, they have exactly the same set of connections. These two are exact replicas of one another. Again, these two at the leaves are exact replicas of one another. This router is almost an exact replica of this one. It has a few, no, in fact it is, it has the same number of connections and everything. So these four routers have exactly the same connections as these four or as these four. So this is a form of what you might call micro-modularization or micro-modules. So each section of a spine and leaf fabric it can be replicated in this way. So that means the two things that we need to look for to understand that something is a fabric is one, is they are non-planar. Two, they are replicating or self-replicating or replicating, I should say. They don't self-replicate. I've never seen a data center fabric actually self-replicate, but they are replicating. And the third is they are regular. That just means the same thing as being replicating, that this looks identical to this. So it's a regular topology. Everything is split up and set up regularly. So the next kind of spine and leaf fabric that we want to look at and try to understand is what's called a Binet fabric. This was invented by uh, Vaclav E. Binet in 1965. There you can actually go find the paper on it if you want to. What Binet was looking for was what is called a rearrangeable clo fabric. So he was trying to find a way to take the clo fabric concept and make it where you could rearrange the layout to solve different kinds of problems. This shares many of the same tech characteristics as a clo fabric does. It is a fabric. It is non-planar. These points they cross. It is replicating. These four are the same as this micromodular, if you want to call it that. 
It also has planar concept in the center. It has two planes along which traffic tra uh, travels. So this is a clove fabric and this is a clove fabric. You notice that the clove fabrics are precisely three stages. Uh, Binet is almost always only five stages or five areas in depth. So this is um, a Binet fabric. And of course, with a true Binet fabric, these would be crossbar fabrics um, in a telco network. And this would be non-blocking because it would be unidirectional. <clears throat> now, if I'm going to translate the Binet to packet switching, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have clove fabrics in the center and then I'm going to have my leaf nodes hanging off the outside here. Now once I make those crossbar fabrics into switches, once I replace those crossbar fabrics with switches, I now make this into what is called a folded fabric. Folded is used for two things when you talk about spine and leaf networks. So you have to be very careful about what you mean when you say the word folded. The first meaning is it means that the traffic can travel bi-directionally on the link. There's no make, there's no break. Tra each device can simply send and receive traffic as it wants to. So this is called folded. When you fold a spine and leaf fabric in this way, it no longer is non-blocking. Why? Because I no longer have admission control, right? I can no longer force the edges to only send the amount of traffic that the network can send without dropping any traffic. Once you get to the point where there is statistical probability that the network could drop traffic, it becomes non-contending. And non-contending only applies to certain formats or styles of fabrics. So most spine and leaf fabrics tend to be non-contending when you get to high enough oversubscription rates, which we'll talk about later, you actually can block off your non-contending characteristics. So in this case, if this router wants to talk up here to this one, we'll call these A and B, it can scatter its traffic across the network in some way to get the traffic there. This is called um, equal cost multipath or multipath, wide fan out multipath, which again, we'll talk more about that later, I think, in this slide set. The trade off to being able to do this is, is that now if A and C both send full stream traffic streams for their entire bandwidth along these two links and they send them both to B, what's going to happen is, is I'm going to have these two traffic streams that are each the same rate as this one link hitting right here at this router, this, this um, edge of this clove fabric or this fabric, the fabric side within the Binet fabric. And it's going to not be able to, this D is not going to be able to shove all that traffic down this link. 50% of that traffic is going to be dropped, assuming all these links are the same. So this is why this is non-contending. It is possible to overrun a Binet or a spine and leaf fabric once it's been folded in order to send the traffic bi-directionally in a way that causes the network itself to fail or to drop traffic. People seem to like to draw, this is exactly the same Binet fabric by the way, but it's drawn with this is here and this is here and here and then this is here and here and then these four are here and then these four are here. It's exactly the same drawing, just flipped around a little bit. This I like to call a spine top or a top of spine top, top of spine, this is your top of spine, to the top drawing. Now a lot of people like to draw their spine and leaf networks this way. I don't personally find them to be this to be very helpful. I actually find this pro, this drawing style to be better, only because I like seeing my spine in the center, my top of spine in the center, and my top of fabric in the center. Um, I should say that's a top of fabric, not a top of spine. But anyway, I like seeing this layer in the center because I think that I can see the fabric layout itself better when I do it this way. A lot of people find this confusing because the top of rack switches, my edge ports are on both the top and the bottom of the fabric. 
Um, I don't find that very confusing, so you can draw them any way you want to, but I tend to prefer drawing them the other way. This is a fat tree. This is still a spine and leaf. Um, the difference here is, is that if these are 10 gig lengths, these are 20 gig lengths. So what you do is you double the bandwidth at every hop. This is a very specific kind of topology, but most people will call anything where there is a differential in speed between the edge ports and th these links and these core links, a fat tree. Okay, so the, the term has a very specific meaning in that it means every hop into the network, you double your bandwidth. If this is one, this is two, and this is four. It has a more colloquial meaning in that people just use it for any time. This is one speed and this is a different speed. In most hyperscale networks, what you'll find is this is 25 gig and these are 100 gig. Or something like that. Or these are 100 gig and these are 400 gig or whatever the case might be. But you won't find a differential between these two link speeds just between this edge port and all of these link speeds in the middle. The fat tree is the original fat tree, the actual fat tree topology, is what's called a universal topology. The reason it's a universal topology is you have all sorts of different topologies we use in networks. We have rings, we have hub and spoke, or, or whatever. We have partial mesh, we have full mesh. We have all these different types of topologies. You can, using tunnels, emulate any topology on top of any other topology. So you can emulate a full mesh by building tunnel links all the way across every one of these devices like this. You can emulate a ring topology by, emulate, by using tunnels to connect all of these edge devices together and creating a ring. So you can emulate any kind of topology on any other kind of topology. Once you've done the work of emulation, you can actually figure out what the efficiency or how much efficiency you lose by calculating the stretch, how many additional hops have to be taken. So if you're emulating a ring topology, to get one step along the ring, you've got to go um, up and down. To get to the next step, you've got to go up and down and up and down. You can calculate what these efficiencies are. The fat tree is the one topology that you can build any other topology on top of, and it will emulate with the least loss of efficiency every other topology that there is. This is interesting because it kind of gives this spine and leaf topology, um, even though they aren't all universal like the fat tree is, this universal ness so that if a particular application likes full mesh between all of its nodes, then the spine and leaf will emulate that with the least amount of loss of efficiency over simply building a full mesh. Or if the application happens to like a ring topology, well, the spine and leaf can kind of emulate that as well with the least amount. Now let's talk about one other topology that's interesting. This is called the butterfly. There you go, butterfly. Now some people don't like it when I call it this, but this is really technically what it is. There are a couple of interesting things about this topology. First, you'll notice that there are defined pods. So when you hear talk, somebody talking about building a pod in a hyperscale or a data center environment, they're generally talking about a butterfly topology, not always, but this is the way you normally do it, is with a butterfly topology. And you have these well-defined pods. Each of these pods is kind of half of a clo fabric. It's not a full three-stage clove fabric, as you will notice. It's only two stages. The third stage, or the fifth stage, depending on the way you look at it, is built by throwing these fabric devices in the center. What you do is, is you have a blue fabric, and you have one um, spine device in each of the pods that connects to the blue fabric. You have an orange fabric, and again, you have one device in each one of the pods that connects to a spine device that connects to the, the orange fabric. So this is sometimes called top of fabric, or the super spine, or it's often just called the fab, the fabric. These are the fabric devices, the fab devices. So you can see that what you have built here is you have built a planar type situation where you have a fabric that can be described by itself. Now there are a couple of interesting things about this style of fabric. Once this top of rack switch makes a decision of which way to go, that traffic will now stay in that blue fabric, say, 
no matter what. So if this top of rack switch decides on the blue fabric using ECMP, there is no path of connectivity that takes it anywhere else in the network, not on the blue fabric. That means that if you lose the entire fabric, you only lose one quarter of your capability on the backplane um, or on the fabric itself. So another interesting thing is, is once you reach this router, once you reach the fab, there is only one path to any destination on the entire network. This is really useful for things like traffic engineering. Now, of course, this greatly reduces the bisectional bandwidth. So while this is still non-contending, you have a very low bisectional bandwidth, but it also allows you to scale really, really, really big with very low port count devices. It's a very interesting uh, network topology, the butterfly. This is a maxed size butterfly with eight port devices. So here you'd have four ports going down, and then you see the four ports going up, then you have the four ports coming down and the four ports going up, four ports on this side, four ports on this side, four ports here, four ports there, four ports here, and four ports down. So this is a maxed out eight port. I sometimes draw them smaller than this as well. Another way of showing this is to fold the butterfly. Remember that clove fabrics, when you use the word folded, it means one of several things. Um, it can mean that you're running bidirectional traffic over the fabric, or it could mean that you are showing it folded, you're drawing it folded with the spine at the top. In the case of a butterfly fabric, it means something slightly different, or it has another meaning. In the case of a butterfly fabric, you can notice that what I've done here is I have actually gathered these fabrics, the blue, all together, and etc. So now what I have is I have a pod here, 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 and a pod here, and a pod here. And I have my fab routers here. And then each of these is the spine router in, of a different color in those fabrics. So those top four are these four. And then you'll notice that I have these light, these not filled ones right here. These are the same as these four. So you can see how these lay out. All I've done is I've turned it on its side, folded it, and shown it to you from the top. So this gives you a better sense of how this looks from the top. So this is flat, and then this is from the top and this is as wired and this is again from the top. I'm looking down at the top of that fabric and I'll show you another diagram of that that might help. This is a 3D representation of the same thing. So I have my top of racks and then I have one router of each color and I have a full connectivity here and then I have my fabs and I have connectivity from each pod into those fabs. Now I'm not showing everything there. Another way that this is often drawn is this way. You'll see this in the hyperscale documentation as you go through and see uh, the way that they draw it is they often draw it that way. So this is your fab. I'll draw these out. This is your fabs. These are the spine routers in each of those in each of those pods and these are your top of uh, rack switches. So, top of rack, spine, fab. Again, top of rack, spine, fab. So that's exactly the same diagram, only they are drawn in different ways. And different people find different ways of, of illustrating this to be helpful, so they will draw it in different ways. Again, most of the time the hyperscalers are going to draw it this way. This is a butterfly fabric. And looking from the top, some people will call this a crossbar because they see these fab routers going this way and then they see these top of rack and spine routers going the other way. This really is not a crossbar. The reason it's not a crossbar is these are just pivot points on the fabric. You actually don't make or break circuits on this. So it kind of looks like a crossbar looking at it from the top. And I can show that to you here. You can see that you have 
your pods running this direction and you have your fabs running this direction. So it kind of looks like a crossbar, but you don't do makes and breaks at these points. So this really is not a crossbar fabric. So that's it for data center fabric in just looking at the way they're built. Um, next we will talk about fabric scaling, how you scale a fabric.